for inviting me. Uh, I've taken some liberties with the title that, he's, that he suggested and so on, and I'm going to go back beyond human history, and I think it's useful every once in a while to do that, just to put things into, into perspective. So, uh, talking about the Mullica Valley, other people would say that's the Great Bay, Mullica River, estuary, a whole host of things. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> What I want to do this evening is give you an overview of the valley, talk about the inlet a little bit, and, but also look into the upper Mullica and provide some perspective there. Uh, and um, that would be over hundreds of years, but I'm going to also talk about, go back even further in time and talk about what we're calling ghost forests. And in that sense, in that sense we may be talking hundreds or maybe thousands of years. And this is part of a part of a new bo book that I'm working on, so I'm going to try some of this out on, on you guys. <laughs> so that black outline there is the is the Mullica Great Bay watershed. Uh, <clears throat> we're just we're just down here a little bit in Smithville, uh, and, and Norm, this is one of Norm, This is one of the things I was telling you about earlier. See this striking feature. And it shows up up here if you follow the Holy Ghost. That's where the Garden State Parkway is built on. So if you know something about the geology of the, of the region, you could understand a lot of that. And so I'm interested in that as well. But this is a relief map that shows, shows the valley, the Great Bay System, Mullica, Wading River, Bass River, just to give you some perspective. And you know South Jersey is flat, 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 flat. So this is, this is, that relief is magnified there. You won't get a nosebleed going up any of those mountains. <laughs> but it's a special place in a whole host of ways. And I'm, a, I'm an estuary ecologist. I work on fishes a lot. Uh, so I'll be talking about some things I don't know as much about. But one of the things that's striking about this system is that over the 30 years that I've been uh, the director at the Rutgers University Marine Field Station, which is located here right at Little Egg Inlet, I've been impressed with the system in a whole host of ways. One of, one is it's, and we believe this is real, one of the cleanest estuaries, i.e. where ocean and freshwater mix, one of the cleanest estuaries on the east coast of the United States. For us, people who aren't haven't thought about it and aren't familiar with it, the first response is, well, that can't be because that's in New Jersey. <laughs> because most people's mental image, unfortunately, is the, the turnpike and the refineries and, and so on. Uh, but in fact, it's true because there aren't, there isn't much industry. I mean, when you talk about industry now, you talk about blueberries and cranberries and, and within the watershed, there's not much else. So that in the human population density, that you can get lost, and hunters do every year in that valley. So it's, it's unique that way because there isn't much human pressure. It's an exceptionally clean system, and it's well protected. And there are, because of the Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge, because of the Great Bay Wildlife Management Area, because of Bass River State Forest, because of, the, because of um, uh, Warden State Forest, it's extremely well and will continue to be protected. So when someone asks me, how big is your laboratory? I say it's about 115,000 acres because that's what's in, in state and federal hands and it's protected. So it's an incredibly unique system. And this gives you some idea. This is the uh, Upper Bass River. Uh, and so all you see in the, in the background is forest foreground you see a lot of marsh. That characterizes a lot of this, a lot of the system. So what I'm going to do today is going to, is going to try to summarize some several approaches that we've taken to understand events over hundreds to maybe thousands of years in the system. So we spent a fair amount of time in helicopters looking over the system. On the other hand, we spent that's bad. Yeah. We spent a lot of time, we spent a lot of time in, uh, in kayaks in the system, 
at all stages of the tide because it's a remote area. You can't drive everywhere. Uh, and we've done a, a number of other techniques. This is a technique called side scan sonar. And we're looking at timbers on the bottom. So we've used a number of approaches to try to decipher what's going on. And be, because I'm a fish biologist and so on, I think about things underwater. And, and that's, that's where I approach, that's how I approach a lot of things. Uh, <clears throat> but it's tough to do. You can't see under the water, especially in, in turbid estuaries and so on. So it's, it's sort of a remote place. And we all know about the Pine Barrens, and there have been an incredible number of great books and coffee table books written on that. But we know less about what's going on underwater. So that, that, that uh, influences my perspective a lot. So again, this is another map of the watershed. And I'm going to talk about this area right in the vicinity of Little Lake Inlet. I'm going to talk about an area uh, a little further upstream, up in the Mullica, and then way up in the Mullica. So those are the areas I'm going to, I'm going to concentrate on. Uh, this is a picture of Little Lake Inlet. This comes from a book I completed in 2015. It's called Station 119. It's the history of the Rutgers University Marine Field Station, which was originally a Coast Guard station, Station 119. So that station has been around since 1937. But in the process of putting that book together, I wanted to understand the dynamics of the system. Because anytime you're at an inlet, that's about the most dynamic area you can find on the coast, and that includes the Mullica Valley. So if you can see these dates here, this is 1840. The inlet is here. Tucker's Island, I'm sure you've heard of Tucker's Island. Uh, this is the end of Long Beach Island, and this is Old Inlet, or it's variously called Beach Haven Inlet, and so on. But by 1870, that inlet has closed up. Long Beach Island goes all the way down here. Tucker's Island, remnants of it are still here. And Little Beach is over here on the, on the south side of the inlet. And then by 1885, Tucker's Island has joined the, joined the mainland. The inlet is still here. Little Beach is still here. This is the, this is the approximate location of the Rutgers Spring Field Station right at the end of um, Great Bay Boulevard or uh, Seven Bridges Road. And then by 1904, it looks similar, although Little Beach has changed. And then again, 1932, Beach Haven Inlet, the, the uh, survivor, the, the successor to Old Inlet, reappears, a new inlet reappears. Little Leg Inlet is still here, and Tucker's Island is back again. So incredibly dynamic area over about over about 100 years. So if you're thinking about how humans use this area, just keep in mind that it's very, very dynamic. It changes all the time. It changes especially in response to, to winter storms. Uh, so incredibly, incredibly dynamic. Uh, <coughs> during Hurricane or Superstorm Sandy, um, the ocean tried to form another inlet, and I know uh, a clamor and tucker who actually took his boat out through <coughs> that inlet. It was short-lived, it sealed itself up again. But incredibly dynamic area. So if you're thinking about Revolutionary War times and so on, remember the inlet has changed a lot over time. And then this is more recent pictures at the end of the inlet. So this is um, Great Bay Boulevard, Seven Bridges Road, outside of Tuckerton. Here's the field station. And this is another image uh, from, let's see, where is the date? I think it's a little This is a 1930 picture. And I, we can date that picture. This is one of the first aerial photos uh, from the state. And that white scar moving down the peninsula is Great Bay Boulevard. That's when that road was initially constructed. It was going to connect. It was called the part of the Ocean Highway. It was going to connect Tuckerton and the mainland to Long Beach Island and to Brigantine and Atlantic City. That was the plan. Never, never happened. Otherwise, it would be the 
functional equivalent of the Atlantic City Expressway. Um, most of the traffic I have to worry about on that road is Diamondback Terrapins. <laughs> so fortunately, fortunately that didn't happen. So there, there are a series of aerial photographs that again remind us, even over short periods of time, how dynamic that system is and how much it's, how much it's changed. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and go all the way up to the upper end of the Mullica. Um, so, um, to give you some perspective, uh, this is the Forks. This is, I think, what's called Rabbit Island up here. The Basco is up here. This is Route 542. This is a 1930s aerial photograph. Route 542 is here, and you've driven, most of you have probably driven by this point here. And you can see a lot of these meanders throughout the system. Here it is here, here it is today, and so on. So that one reason that 1930s image is so great is because in the 1930s there were all kinds of forest fires, and it burned all the vegetation down. So the aerial images show the watered areas really well. Um, Mark Dimitrov and other people who have thought about the area think this is these meanders in the system in the Mullica, in the upper Mullica, date back to glaciation about 10,000, 12,000 years ago. And uh, it seems to me, I'm not a geologist, but it seems to me he has a good understanding of what's, of what's happened here. Uh, some of these meanders are not as evident as in this 1930s image, because they've changed a lot. But if you're in a helicopter, as I was in October 2016, you can see one of these meanders. This is the Baxdale, below Baxdale Village. You can just see the watershed here. This is the Mulligan in the background, and you can see we refer to this as McPhee's meander in, in remembrance of what John McPhee wrote about the system and so on. But you can see there's a very different, this is fall of the year, so this is deciduous trees, their leaves are turning color and so on, but the pines are. So it sticks out. So those meanders are still there, but they don't have water in them. So that's, that's <clears throat> those things might be 10,000 years old. So again, there's a lot of interesting geology going on in the system, and it influences the system in a whole lot of ways. So take a look at that meander in the fall of 2016, and you can clearly see it in the upper center of the image in spring of this year, uh, because the vegetation is turning green and so on. It's a lighter green than the ponds. So when you think about these systems, remember, we're not just thinking about since Revolutionary War days, the geology of the area has a lot to do with how we use the system, how we understand the system, and of course the ecology of the system. Uh, and these meanders occur elsewhere in the system. This is another helicopter image. This is the Wading River looking downstream. This is the Garden State Parkway Bridge, and you can see how these uh, natural uh, rivers in the system meander over the place. And these oxbows or meanders are common, common features in the system. They seem to be disconnected. Uh, you can tell that the uh, original uh, stream bed went this way, went around, and came back down. But with increasing sea levels, these things are being flooded out. Anytime you see an image like this, this gives you a, a good understanding of what it looked like naturally. If you see a linear creek, a linear river, you know that man, man has had an influence on it. And actually, that's what I wanted to ask you guys about in these, in these prior meanders that I was showing you. I'm trying to figure out if those were uh, closed off by Mother Nature or that was a human thing because as you know, there was a lot of activity up in the forks and so on, uh, relative uh, to a lot of the Revolutionary War activities. 
And I wondered if they just wanted to straight the river for shipping. So if anybody has any insights into that, I'd, I'd like to know. And then we have more recent phenomena like Superstorm Sandy. <clears throat> so in essence, that storm came right in over the field station. It made little difference because it was about a thousand miles wide, but it had an influence on the system as well. So that um, if we piece together some images over time, well, I want to put this in perspective. So on this axis is height in feet above mean of water, and these are the storms that have influenced the area since the uh, since the 1940s and so on. So this is the March 1962 nor'easter, and you can see the level of the storms, and this is uh, Superstorm Sandy here, and I think that's Irene there as well. So we've had a number of storms over time. If you, um, if you talk to people who've been around a long time, they'll often refer to the storm, not the year, uh, because they remember how, how how much of an impact they had. So let me uh, orient you a little bit. This is uh, aerial view, a series of aerial views of the Rutgers Marine Field Station just inside Bowdoin Inlet. And they start in the upper left in 1995, 2002, 2007, 2012, 2015. And then there's a summary here. And you can see that this, the, you can see how broad this marsh is here relative to this walkway. And this shows you the shorelines from 1995, 2002, 7, 12, 15. Look at the erosion that is happening here. It's about the rate, even just since in 20 years, we are losing that marsh edge at about a rate of about a foot a year. That's dramatic. Again, a very, very dynamic system, and one of it is a proximity to the Leg Inlet and storms and so on, but the other thing is sea level rise. So again, all these systems that we want to study, want to know about, want to know about human history, they're changing. They're changing all the time and we have to keep that in mind. Uh, I'm going to switch gears again on you and then start talking about how sea level is beginning to really influence our system. So this is a photograph from a helicopter of uh, that body of water in there. It's called Otter Pond. It's uh, part of Big Creek. It's right outside Port Republic. And um, you can see typical salt marsh system. This is in the fall of the year. A lot of green trees here, some trees turning colors with the season. But you see a whole swath of dead trees here. These are what we refer to as ghost forests. They're, they're dead, they're still standing, and if you look more closely at them, you can see, and begin to interpret a lot of these dead trees, and the marshes are invading the forest. These, and most of these are Atlantic white cedar. We're focusing on Atlantic white cedar because it's, um, it's an incredible, it's, it's been an important wood for a long period of time. That's what shingles were made out of, that's what ship, ma ship masts were made out of, but houses and a whole host of things. Because it's light, it's incredibly light, and it's incredibly rot resistant. So it lasts forever. So these trees, even though they've been dead for a long time, are still, are still standing. So these tools for us, we think, are a signature of, of sea level rise because uh, they naturally grow in freshwater bogs. They cannot grow in salt water. So when they're exposed to salt water, it kills them. And that's what you have with increasing when the sea level rise. You have uh, higher tides uh, happening. You have salt water getting further up the systems. Now, how far up are they, Ken? Pardon? How far up the river are they? This is at Port Republic. Okay. This is Port Republic, but it goes on up, and I'll show you on a map in just a second. 
but there are even older signals of these ghost forests around. So this is uh, the Upper Bass River, uh, and you see ghost forests here, and I talked to the people who lived here, and I asked them how long these dead trees have been there, and they said, well, we moved in 60 years ago and they were there then. Wow. But sea level has been rising for a long time. But at any rate, those dead trees were there. But look at all this. That's all Atlantic white cedar, and it has been buried under the marsh and it's being exposed. So I think in a lot of the marshes around here, if you take a you take a, a metal pole and go out there, you won't go, you'll go in some places where you can push the pole as far as you want, and it'll be all marsh. Other places you could hear it, thunk, thunk, thunk. And this is, this is buried cedar. People have known about this for long periods of time. People have known about this for hundreds of years. When they initially start cutting white cedar and they decimated most of the trees around, people start to mine the cedar. They would go out with a metal pole, they called it a probe, and they would sound through the, through the marsh muck until they found something. Then they'd figure out, okay, this tree is stretches this way, this way, if we cut this in, cut this in, we can bring it to the surface. And they mined Atlantic white cedar back into the 1900s. These are buried 10, 12, as much as 15 feet under the muck. So how did that happen? Well, they died a long, long time ago. Sedimentation occurred, and with increasing sea level rise, some of these are being exposed. So they're really, really dramatic. The only way you can see this is at a really dead low tide. So there's just an immense amount of that, and our interpretation is that what you see is there's some of these trees in the background are living Atlantic white cedars. Some are, well, I'm not sure if those are Atlantic white cedars, but these trees have been around for a long, long period of time, and we think they're being re-exposed with sea level rise. And some of them are quite large. This is out of that otter pond that, that I showed you. That white part of that kayak paddle is 18 inches long. So that's a big, that's a big cedar. Uh, they used to get that way all the time, several feet across, four feet across. Um, and if you look carefully, George Cook did this and he published a thing in 1868 where they had looked at some of the cedars growing along Delaware Bay, and you can count, you know, you've all seen the rings in a tree when it's been cut down. They estimated, well, they didn't estimate, they counted a thousand rings. So some of these trees were a thousand years old. So they, some of them grew to be a thousand years old, died, were buried and being resurrected. So that we think the Atlantic white cedar, because they last so long, because they're rot resistant, are a good indicator of past sea levels. Again, because um, they only grow in fresh water, but here they're being exposed to salt water, like like in this, like in the otter pond here. So our our uh, kayaking around uh, the system, one of the, uh, one of my colleagues, Pat Pilardi, has done a lot of this with me. And wherever there's a symbol, X indicates we have no ghost forest <coughs> present there. And with there's a black dot we have, we have presence of ghost forest. So you see, we've looked at a lot of the system. So where we have ghost forest is up in the tributaries. Again, to orient you, this is the bass, this is the wading. This is the main stem of the Mullica. And so we have, they're really quite common, and a lot of this is Naco Creek here. And I'll show you more information right near Fort Republic, more information there. We don't see the ghost forests here, but we think they're, they're present. It's just the marsh sediments are very, very deep. <clears throat> We know they're deep because the pilings at the Coast Guard Station, Station 119, the Rutgers Marine Field Station sits on, are 30 feet long. We were trying to do some renovations. We said, they asked, well, how deep are your pilings? We don't know, but they were able to measure their depth 
Some of the pilings are 30 feet deep and they rest on a sand base. So there's 30 feet of sediments there. So we think possibly those things are buried. And better proof of that is that in, there's a 1954, it's such a terrible image, I can't show it because, but in 1954, in the Newark Evening News, there's a picture, and they were building Garden State Parkway Bridge over the Mullica. They used a dredge to dredge holes out so they could build the platforms to support the bridge. They found Atlantic white cedar 40 feet down in the muck. So it's possible that those ghost forests are there. They're just buried. And that would happen with continuing sea level rise. So they're really common, they're really common features. And I'll give you a specific example and one that, oh, okay. And then the other thing is, you know, aging these things. That's tough to do. Um, but one of the things that gave us some hints about some of these ages are creeks like this, where there are old corduroy roads exposed. A lot of the corduroy roads probably date back to Revolutionary War times. They're really quite frequent. You can only see many of these at low tide because sea level is higher now. But there's about a foot and a half of sediment on top of that. And this is in a natural area. There isn't much else around. But a couple hundred years ago, people were using, were using that marsh. So that gives us some hints as to how old some of these features are. <clears throat> the place where we spent a lot of time uh, looking into this is Port Republic. Um, again, Naco Creek, or, or if you've been here a long time, it's Naked Creek. Uh, goes into the Bullock here. Here's the town of Port Republic. Here's the dam. Used to be the mill pond. Well, this is the mill pond here. So we're here's the parkway. So we're at exit 44 if you want to get oriented. So up here there is natural living Atlantic white cedar. It's it, it's fine. But I want to show you some shots of this area here. So this is a recent sort of Google Earth image. <clears throat> this is what a uh, living Atlantic white cedar forest looks like. Sometimes the trees fall down in windstorms and a whole host of things, but again, that's fresh water. Just a very short distance from there, um, this is what um, current an aerial photograph, this is the dam. Port Republic is up here. This is a 1930 aerial image. So look at this. Look at this area here. Well, I'll show you that this area, the area in red shows the current shoreline. I'm sorry, it, 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 it agrees with this shoreline. This is a 1930 aerial image. Look how much narrower Naco Creek is then. Uh, I talked to the mayor, Gary Guyerson, uh, and he told me that the WPA efforts in the 1930s during the Depression dredged out a lot of the a lot of the channel on this side, and that's why they have basketball courts and tennis courts and so on there. But across the river, they didn't they didn't do much. But look at the difference today in 1930. Look at all this marsh here. That marsh is gone. We think it's gone because of sea level rise, and you get a, a hint of this. This is another aerial photograph. So, tennis courts, the beach at Port Republic, here's the dam, this is Riverside Road, and you can drive there yourself and see this. If you get on Riverside Drive and look right here, you can see some old marsh, and you can see a lot of exposed wood here. So that lot, that slide I showed you before, this is the edge of the marsh in the 1930s photograph. Now, obviously, that's going to be different depending on the stage of the tide. But that marsh is gone. And under that marsh is all this submerged Atlantic white cedar. So that cedar wasn't there in the 1930s. We think it's been there a long time. And this is what that looks like looking uh, from, from uh, the dam. You can see all the cedar is being uh, exposed. 
exposed out of the marsh. As sea level has risen, it's washed away the sediments in the marsh, and those timbers are there. And we have more confidence in that because we use a technique called radiocarbon dating. If you ask me to explain that to you, I'll just walk out because I don't know how it works. But it's a, but it's a carbon isotope, and they can look at that ratios over time. So it's, a, it's an accepted aging technique, and it's been used for lots of years. So we have samples from some of the timbers right here. They are 500 years old. So in other words, those trees were alive before Columbus got here. So this is the time frame that we think we're working with. This is a work in progress, and we're still trying to get some more dates and so on. But again, I think even if you just focused on human history in the last couple hundred years, it helps to understand the broader history of, of what has been going on. So uh, again, you can see this. You can see this from your car window. You barely have to slow down to see it if you're there at a low tide. And and on the other side of the road, you can see all this process in sort of microcosm. So these are living and landing white cedars here. All these dead trees are the ghost forests. The standing dead trees are the ghost forests that I'm talking about. Here you can see a lot of dead trees as well. It's hard to see on this image, but there are dead trees down here as well. And this is marsh. This is Phragmites. But that was a forest. That was a freshwater bog. Now it's being invaded by marsh and salt water. So in that one slide, you can see something that may represent a couple hundred years or maybe even a thousand years. So this is a slow process. But it's, it's happening, and it appears to be uh, accelerating. Um, and we have a lot more work to do. Uh, and one of the techniques we're using is the, the called side scan sonar. So the principle is the same as a fish finder. You get on a boat, you turn on your fish finder, and you paint off the bottom, and you know what depth you're in. And so but this is a multi-beam thing, and it, it searches the bottom. This is a trap. From the Bass River uh, just last week, or a couple of weeks ago, this midline here is the track under the boat. You can't see under the boat, but it scans to each side. And the way it's mounted on this boat, it gives a clear image to the right. <clears throat> this is all old Atlantic white cedar on the bottom in about seven, about six, about six feet of water. So six feet of water. Uh, is even, you know, those have been there even longer. They're not up in the marsh, they're deeper. And so these might be even older. And when we were on the boat that day, we were able to take a long piece of pipe that we sharpened fine. We did the same thing that the miners, cedar miners did. We probed around till we found one of these things, sent a pipe down, brought a piece of wood back. I have no idea, hundreds to thousands of years old. Smell that piece of wood, it smells like cedar. There's no there's no denying what it what it is. So these are really common features and we're really anxious to figure out what the dates are for some of these. And this is another this is another uh, example here. This may be a larger stump. It picks up linear features, pieces of timber better, and we have to figure out if uh, make sure all these are old, not just recent. Uh, recent pilings or something from somebody's dock, but uh, as we said, a lot of this is cedar. So these are some of the approaches we're using to try to understand events in the Mullica Valley over the last hundred or, or perhaps a uh, thousand years. So this is part and parcel of what I'm trying to do. This is a working title of a book. Uh, that I'm trying to bring, that I'm trying to bring together now. But it helps me to, under, if I understand the geological history, hundreds, thousands of years, then it, it puts the, the, the present in, into a real perspective. So uh, this, is, this is where this is coming from, and that's a lot of the, uh, that's, where, that's where I'm going. So I'd be glad to answer any questions. I hope you have questions. If you don't have questions, I'll ask you some. Ken, there's a story that I've not been able to verify. 
<laughs> Go back to 1778 in your mind and think of the British expedition up to Chestnut Neck where they burned the village. At that time, Port Republic is called Wrangleboro. There's a story that seems to have been commonly told that some of the area residents moved up Nakoti Creek, but on the not Port Republic side, the other side, and probably down about where maybe Old New York Road comes in and that second bridge is, and along that side, and they had a, a, a terrible enough winter there in, in makeshift dwellings that it, it got the name of something like, a, oh, some morbid name, like a, whatever you would call a, what do you call that? There's an old western name for a hill. A, Boot Hill. Not Boot Hill, but oh, some... Brimstone Hill. Brimstone Hill, that was well, it. Brimstone well, Hill. The story that <clears throat> I've heard about Brimstone Hill was because of the... The, the tree, certain variety of trees were more attracted to lightning than attract lightning. And it had a, lightning strikes, gave it a bright sulfur smell. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, but, but, but supposedly people live there. I just wondered, but you know, you put up a, an interesting picture with it, maybe about six slides back, where you showed Nakoti Creek. And that creek is, was much narrower then. Right, right, right. And so there would have been much more land then. Uh, yeah, oh, oh, well, maybe not there. Yeah, that's much uh, way back when, much narrower. Yeah, well, the 19... Oh, yeah, so I should show you. And we also yeah, the 19, so this is the 1930 aerial image, and you can see that that's the point. This is the current shoreline, more or less. This is the 1930 shoreline. So, yeah, Nago okay. Creek is much, much narrower. Much, much narrower then. And you answered another question historically for us that we've been struggling with in the British records of Chestnut Neck. The British recorded that when they came in, they thought they had an armed fort, but there wasn't there. But there were two forts in the British records. Mm -hmm. One was at the level where you go through that little gate, you know, and go out there on that filled piece of circular ground. But they said behind it and off to the side was an elevated gun emplacement, and we could not for the life of us figure out where that was. And Gary Guyberson, he, all he could tell us is there may have been a hill back there. But your comment to me before you started about the Garden State Parkway being built on what was probably the remains of an old set of sand dunes from thousands of years ago, and it was elevated in a strip all up and down the coast, and that was the roadbed for it. That would explain the, the placement, why they could put a gun in place. Yeah, right. Now, but, I had never heard that before. If you look at, there is an old map that I've seen that shows there's almost nothing there, but it references Chestnut Ridge. So there must have Chestnut been... Chestnut Ridge? Ridge, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a copy of that map. Okay. It's you said they buy it. They used to buy the... What, the, yeah, yeah. What, what could they use it for when they mine it? Uh, there are incredible stories, and, and you read it often enough that it's true. When, some, when they mine some of these Atlantic white cedar, and again, 10, 12, 15 feet down, when they cut the edges of this, of this long trunk, it would float to the surface. It refuses to rot many times, and they went right to the sawmill with it. So what would the effect be if they started mining them again? Uh, I think it's probably prohibitive, you know. Well, that's right. I think prohibitive. Right. Yeah. Isn't Cedar outlawed now to sell in New Jersey? Yeah, I think I think there's some legal restrictions. We, we, to put do a, that. we put a uh, cedar fence around our yard, but we had to get the wood for the counter. Well, yeah. We couldn't. No, get the it's uh, it's around, and it's and like I said. The, the, I wish this. This image from this 1954 Newark Evening News thing was a clear image, and I should have actually, in retrospect, showed it to you, even though it's a terrible image. But Forty feet down, they were getting these timbers, and I said, well, why? And I asked a lot of people, Tucker and Historical Society, and I'm asking you guys now, why didn't we ever hear about this? And I, um, John Yates put me in touch with Sam Leifrid? 
L-E-I-F-R-E-D? I'm not sure. Anyway, I talked to him. His father ran the dredge, remembered these stories, and I said, why isn't this in local papers or in the Atlantic City Press? Because these are massive trees, massive, massive trees. And he said, well, probably because these guys have recognized their worth and they sold them to a sawmill in Cape May and turned them into shingles. They were making money on the side off these old buried cedars. And uh, that, that was his version. There's a house on Mill Street, Fort Reed Public. It's either one or two houses in towards the old Ford store on the your right side. Uh, then in a back room, there is a fireplace mantle was made from one of these cedar logs. And there's a plaque on it. The story I was told about at the time I saw it was that the person in charge of building that parkway overpass, they hit a cedar log so huge it stopped their equipment. Yeah. And then the, the, the job foreman said, that's mine. And it became, a piece of that became the mail in the house. I've heard that story before. There was a Where was that house? It's uh, the first, I think, of the second house in. I, hope, I haven't been there in 30 <coughs> years. I, but it would be one of those two houses. What I'd like to do. I had friends that were students at what was then Stockton. Yeah. Richard Stockton College. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. But, I would like to, <laughs> here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to find out who owns that, ask for <laughs> permission to go in there and take a core out of that mantle and get a radiocarbon date on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, and I'll, I'll ask first. Yeah. It was in the back room on the back of the house away from the street, and it was a man with a, a fireplace mantle. I've heard that story before, but I never knew where it came on. from. Yes, oh, Gary. I, I've talked to Gary. He has, you, you think Gary would know? Gary would know. He may not want to tell you exactly. Yeah, well, that's... To protect, yeah. Some, to protect the innocent or the guilty. Yeah, yeah. well, that's a long time ago. Okay. But now, I find this interesting, the, the two aerial photographs, because with the sea level rise, the third is Van Zandt's shipyard was no longer in active. It was almost in front of the church. But there's a... Is that where it was in front of the church? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. And you see, there's an outline on the map, the red, of the 1930s aerial photograph. Yeah. It's, you've got lots of land showing and a narrow channel. If you look at the same location on the, the more recent aerial photograph, yeah. that narrow channel is gone and it's full with much more water. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I know where this is, yeah. Yeah. And and so the church is where? The church, church is where? should be, the ball, the tennis courts are there, you go straight up, the, the driveway comes down opposite the church parking lot. Church isn't quite in the church church church. Church. Okay. Because when I'm here, I spent a lot of time on the road here looking at this old, old, um, old ghost forest, and I always put the church in the background of my photographs yeah. to help me remember where it is. And so yeah, that makes sense. It's right right here. But you can drive that road and you can see, if you're there in the low tide, you can see you can see a lot of what I'm what I'm talking about. So again, I think I just think that that understanding the, the geological history over hundreds to to even thousands of years tells us a lot about what uh, the human history of, of these areas as well. I have a question. Yeah. Not that I'm disputing uh, the sea level rise, I do believe in that, but I had uh, years ago read that the southern end of New Jersey was subsiding. So how uh, how do you know this isn't subduction rather than sea level rise? Yeah, good question. So this is a published paper. It was published in 2013 by a Rutgers University geologist. And here is, since 1900, here's the global average in sea level rise, globally. But here's sea level.
level rise. This is, these are tide gauges at Atlantic City since 1900. And there is subsidence going on. So, uh, again, because perhaps because we're drawing water out, but also because of rebound since the last glaciers. So, yes, there's both happening. But we happen to be in a part of the world where it's happening more. Sea level rise is more striking because we have sea level rise, because the height of water is more striking because we have sea level rise and the coastline is subsiding. So both things are going on. Okay. Someone once said to me that South Jersey has only been above water for the last 20,000 years, and for since the Earth is 4.8 billion years old, as a normal condition for South Jersey to be underwater. Well, certainly a lot of the sediments in the aquifer yes. are old marine sediments. Yes. That's when that sand was deposited there. So again, in, over geological history, a lot of things have happened. The ocean was over South Jersey, and then when uh, temperatures got cooler, a lot of the water was tied up in glaciers yes. and ice sheets. Sea level Shrank, yeah. and so our coastline about 12,000 years ago was about 50 miles east of us. Wow. So, there, yeah, there's a lot that is going on uh, over, especially since the glaciation. Any other questions?